In this video, we're going to talk about energy, which is a wonderful topic. It's one of my favorites because it requires a lot less work than using forces to analyze complex problems. Now, before we do anything complicated, let me give you the physics definition of the word energy. The fundamental definition of energy is the ability to make stuff move faster. And by stuff, what I mean is mass. So if, there, if you have some mass and you can make it speed up, then that requires energy to do. Anything that can make that happen involves energy. There are many types of energy, but for now we're going to begin with only three just to keep things nice and simple since it's your first time dealing with it. They are GPE, KE, and EPE. You might have a teacher who uses some different language here, but it all means the same stuff. So let me jump right into it because energy isn't going to require near as much explanation as forces did. So the first one is GPE, which stands for gravitational potential energy. And what that means is the energy of position above the ground. The higher you have something above the ground or the chunkier it is, the more gravitational potential energy it has. As sort of a way of believing that, if you're laying down on your back and somebody holds a bowling ball two inches above your body and drops it, you're not very afraid. But if they hold it 10 feet off the ground, well, you're quite afraid of that bowling ball. And that's because the bowling ball has more energy. Even though you can't see that energy yet, energy is the ability, the potential to make something move faster. And when anything is chunky and high off the ground, it has a lot of energy, even if that energy isn't being spent yet. And here's and the formula for it is gravitational potential energy equals mass times 9.8 times height. Or I'm going to use a 10 just to keep the math nice and simple in the videos. And as a sample problem, I've got a 5 kilogram rock. It's 3 meters up off the ground. And we want to know how much energy it has. So we just do MGH equals 5 times 10 times 3. And I get 150 joules of energy. A joule is the unit that we use for energy. And it's named after a famous scientist by the name of Joule. Next up, we've got KE, which is short for kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is the energy of movement. If you have a mass that's in motion, then it has energy. Because if energy is the ability to make stuff move faster, well, if you already have one object that's moving, then it's surely capable of making another object move faster, right? If you have a football player and he runs into the quarterback, he can slow down in order to speed up the quarterback. So kinetic energy is another form of energy. And the formula for it is 1 half times mass times velocity squared. I want you to make a note really fast of the fact that this V is squared, but the M is just a regular old M. That's going to be important in the future because in kinetic energy, velocity is more important than mass. If I were to double the velocity of something, I would quadruple its energy, not double it. But if you double the mass, you would only double the energy. So pay close attention to the fact that there's a V squared here. That's important for a lot of physics stuff. Anyway, here's a sample problem. If I've got a 6 kilogram block and it's just cruising on a sheet of ice at 3 meters per second, then its kinetic energy would just be 27 joules. Last but not least, we've got EPE, which stands for elastic potential energy. And that's the energy stored in a spring. Anytime you've got an object that's kind of stretchy, where if you compress it or stretch it, it tends to snap back into place, there's energy involved there because when you stretched it, you allowed it to create motion in the spring or in an object attached to the spring. Anyway, elastic potential energy is simply equal to 1 half times the spring constant K times how far you stretch the spring from its relaxation point, which is x, and you square that. Notice how these two formulas are very simple, or similar rather. They have a 1 half, and they both have something squared on it. If you've already taken calculus, that should be no surprise to you. That's not a coincidence that those two go together. But I wouldn't worry about it too much. But once again, make sure that you remember that the x is more important than the k here. If you double how far you stretch a spring, you will quadruple its energy. If you triple how far you stretch a spring, you will nine oople its energy because of this squared thing here. So make sure you really make a note of that. And for a sample problem, if I've got a spring here that has a spring constant of 200 newtons per meter, and I stretch it half a meter from its happy point, from its resting place, 
then we would say the elastic potential energy in the spring is 25 joules of energy. And I've got one last piece of information before we finish things up. Now here's what makes energy awesome, is with Newton and forces and stuff, there were a lot of rules to remember, but with energy, there's just one. And that rule is that the total energy at the beginning of a problem has to equal the total energy at the end, unless something outside added energy to the system or took it away. Otherwise, the total energy does not change. That's all you really need to know. So the method we're going to use to solve the problems coming up looks a lot like this. We're simply going to make a chart showing all of the types of energy at the beginning of the problem and all the types of energy at the end of the problem. So really fast, if I've got at the beginning of the problem, you have something on a cliff that's compressed by a spring and then the spring shoots it off the cliff and we want to know how much energy, how much kinetic energy it has at the bottom, how fast it's going. Well, we can figure out that the total energy has to be the same at the beginning and end. It's 15 joules, which means the kinetic energy here simply has to be 7.